So it's a residential alternative to a traditional continuing care facility that integrates housing, care, delivery, and the CHR. The term designated indicates health region is funding through established partnership. Professional registered nurses service the care plan. Uh, now, the professional registered nurses are owned by the region, and then we partner with either a voluntary, which is faith-based, or a private agency to run the um, place. Um, there's 24 on-site professional nursing services are provided by LPN, and the support is provided by a team of on-site personal care workers run by the facility. Eligibility for designated assisted living is determined by the assessment of community care registered nurse through the co coordinated access process. So only people that normally would have got into long-term care get there. Um, so soon we have, the, right away within a year or so, we'll have the majority of our beds will be uh, designated assisted living. We've had a lot of experience. The price is about two-thirds of what long-term care costs. We've done the MDS, the people do better. Uh, we do everything, it's another whole talk about how we maintain independence and their dignity and it's, it's just a different mentality for what's happening in long-term care. Uh, they determine their diet, when they'll be, what'll happen, etc. We have two types, we have cottage homes, we have the bigger ones for the physically disabled. And I was going to spend a bit of time telling you about one community, Pincher Creek, about 8,000 size community, which I'm sure you have a few of those, and they had an ina inadequate number of about 31 beds in their long-term care. They knew it wasn't enough, and they were people going all over. Uh, I was in the newspaper, you know, Jubber sends people throughout region uh, like turnips, and so we had to do something to fix the problem, and so we wanted to build a 55-bed assisted living, and so we convinced them to, but we thought we'd keep 11 long-term care beds. Trouble is, with the budget crunch at that particular time, 2003 or whenever it was, the government said there's not enough money, so we decided not to have the long-term care. So there became huge battles again. So finally said we will keep three long-term care beds in the hospital if you case you need them, but we're going to build this 55-bed unit. And we did, and uh, the funding, they received 25% of the funding for this private agency from a <clears throat> government grant, and the rest was there was paid for and so even paying for the capitalization of the project it was st still two-thirds the price of what we were paying just for direct care in long-term care in five years now we've never used one of the long-term care beds that should tell you a story that these are a true alternative to long-term care uh, and this was just some mds stuff to show that we actually had some people improve we had people that normally wouldn't, couldn't dress themselves, bathe, or do anything, we're doing it. And the savings were amazing. In fact, in our region, we were saving close to about $20 million a year and just starting on it relative to the other regions, and that allowed us to set up a bunch of other programs that others weren't. And so it was um, very important, and I don't have time for that. So I'll just do this slide and maybe you can take a couple of questions because I don't like to do all the talking, but what happened with this is that where we had a regional hospital that had just a load of ALC people, like we, we, had, we have 64 medical beds, 64 surgical beds, we had close to 60 ALCs. With, with soon, we were down to eight ALCs. We essentially opened up two units, um, and you can imagine the flow. I mean, we had, we were down for a while there to 85 percent, and then trouble getting the building going, and we ran short again. And now, starting I think this month, we we again have an excess now of 30 beds, and so it should change again. But while we had those beds, it made a phenomenal difference. We were able to increase our though there's surgery in a lot of the rural towns as well, in the main regional center, we had six open theaters. We were able to go to 8.5 theaters, which normally you can't do because you don't have the beds to support them. Now we had the beds to support them at no extra cost. There were, like I say, one quarter, there were 22 empty blocks that went begging because the surgeons couldn't, and that had uh, helped us with the recruitment. 
And um, where the length of stay in, in the emergency, uh, when a person's admitted, like my daughter was in Edmonton and needed to be admitted, it was over 24 hours before she could get in. In our regional hospital, it's 90% of people within 90 minutes. Um, and so the physicians know that as well, and the nurses, and that certainly helps. And because of that, we also were able to close five acute care hospitals rurally um, that were close to Lethbridge and, and uh, were very small. And in my mind, it was inappropriate to keep acute care services there when they were doing things like, you know, only eight deliveries uh, a year. And, and, uh, but with the beds, we were able to argue the case. So not only did we save, if we felt that if we had saved that much money in our region for uh, long-term care and the changes to a more community way of doing it, the savings in the province would be you know, 20 times that much. But that's only counting part of the savings because when you can actually increase your acute flow, then you've really saved uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. So sorry I took so long on this, but I really think it was the fundamental underpinning of getting us going. It was also the fundamental underpinning of getting physician support to attack other problems. Because when they could see that as an administration, we had made life better for them, we had got better outcomes. And if there's anything that speaks to your title of building efficiency and quality at the same time, our last CEO used to say, there's not many times in medicine that you can do things better for cheaper. And this certainly was one of those times. Um, we've done a few things, and like this is one um, little kind of worksheet that we had done for ourselves to find out for those people that have been in Enhanced Lodge in the past year, what percentage of them had to leave? And so 25% of them were, went one place or the other. And all the 25 that left, 43% of them uh, died in place or, or were able to live there to the end of their lives. The most of the rest of them were able just to go to a uh, DAL just with more care. And there was a few of them that went uh, to long-term care and there was a few that still went home. So, so we did that. The other thing that we did is that we measured the deaths per 10,000 resident days. And we found that the deaths per 10,000 resident days in long-term care was about 9.6 deaths per 10,000 resident days in our assisted living, about 5.6, and our enhanced lodge, 3.6. And we want to repeat that to see if it stays, but these are figures that we'll see. The weaknesses of what I think we have right now, I think we need more um, recreation and, and rehab in our um, models. In some, the places that we have that, and a lot of it is just because clever people do clever things, uh, we're, we're getting better success. So, and there was one other, let me just see. For our DAL, 22% of them went on. You can see very much most of them aged in place and were able to stay there in that setting, and very few of them went to long-term care. And in long-term care, the percentage of those that pass away each year is, is, is more. So, um, of the assessments that we do, basically, and this is two years ago, I, I look, reviewed it just a couple of weeks ago to see if it's the same. It is essentially the same with the last year as it is there. I just couldn't figure it out on the computer, not being very techy, how to change the 05 to an 07. You can see uh, Alberta, we, compared to Alberta, have the lowest uh, number of beds.